But we are, again, in this passage in Colossians chapter 1. If you haven't turned to it already, please turn to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, as we've been worshiping this morning, we've been singing and we've been praising one name. And what is that name that we worship? Jesus Christ, that's right. And so we are looking at Colossians, and one of the things that drew me to this passage, passage in Colossians is that it is so Christ-centered. And this whole book of Colossians really is very is a very Christ-centered book. And so when we worship, well, obviously when we come together every Sunday, we are worshiping the one true God, and yes, we are worshiping Jesus Christ for what he's done uh, for us in our salvation. And this letter was written by the Apostle Paul. And it was written to the Colossian believers in order to correct some of the wrong thinking that was spreading in their church. Uh, this book is known as one of the prison epistles, they call it, because it was written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. And when we think of that, we typically think about you know, him in like a dungeon somewhere, but actually this first Roman imprisonment was more of like a house arrest type situation. Um, and there's a verse uh, in Acts chapter 28, verse 16. It says, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So there he was under guard, but he was there in a, in a house. And then in chapter 28, verses 30 and 31 of Acts, it says, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. And that is what is going on as Paul is writing the book of Colossians that we are reading from. He is there in Rome, and he's able to have a ministry there from where he's at. Up until this point in the book that we're going to be looking at, Paul has been having a very personal touch in his writing. He's been praying for the Colossian believers. In verses 3 through 8, he was praying for and thanking God for their salvation and the faith that they had as Christians. And then in the verses following that, verses 9 through 14, he, he prays and he asks God that they would grow in their Christian faith. And these are good things for a believer to pray for, for ourselves and for others. But now, beginning in verse 15, Paul is starting a new section in the book where he is really getting into and emphasizing the main point for what he's writing about. And that, again, is Jesus Christ. As we look at the first verse in verse 15, uh, we see that it doesn't mention Jesus Christ in that verse. Uh, we see that it says who or he in my Bible. And that is pointing back to something before that. So as we get started, I want to look back at verse 13 and 14. Verse 13, it says, And for he rescued us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through, the, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so there it mentions in the end of verse 13, his beloved Son. It's talking about God, the Son. It's talking about Jesus Christ in this passage. That is the he or the who in the beginning of verse 15. And so he is the subject of our entire passage. And really he is the subject, we can say, of the entire Bible. Now, the theme of this book, we can say, is the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Christ. Our title for today, for our message, is Christ, our Creator and Sustainer. As we begin to look at these things, many thoughts could, was going through my head as I was looking at this passage. I think about, it's so impressed upon my mind whenever I interact with people in the world, and of course I have, you know, whenever I go to work and I'm, I'm surrounded by my own believers every day, and there are so many different views about Jesus out there, isn't there? Uh, so many different things that people believe and think about Jesus. If you were to ask people what they believe, just so many different ideas. Many people say that he's a, he was a good man, that he was a good teacher. Many people recognize that he's, yes, he's the main person of Christianity. But when they say that, they're, they're not accepting him as their God or anything. They're thinking also about how, you know, Buddha is the main guy in Buddhism, and Muhammad is the main guy in, in Islam, the Muslim faith. And, but then there's Jesus, who's the main guy in, in Christianity. And that's what just many people think about. But this is uh, relativism. This is 
us living in a pluralistic society with different religions and many different faiths that people say are all true but in reality are not. Here in Colossae that Paul was writing to, people had much the same ideas that we had in our day today. They had these different ideas. That he, there was a church there that had bad theology and people that were creeping into actually false teachers and were, and were trying to teach things that were not true and not true about Jesus. And they emphasized some things wrongly, such as about angels, as talked about later in the book, that they lifted up angels almost to the same level as Jesus. And so they were getting these things wrong. They were listening to these things. And maybe it was uh, some remnants of how they were saved from a life of believing in multiple gods, and they hadn't sh totally shed themselves of this, and the false teachers were further complicating the situation. Another thing that was going on in the church is there was uh, an early form of what we call agnosticism, um, which says that we can't really know the truth uh, fully. And it was just this, in an early form back then, but we have it very prevalent today, where many people say that uh, everything is right all at the same time. There is not one truth. There is not uh, one thing that is absolute morally or in terms of truth. They would say that everything is all vague and fuzzy and we're just not quite sure about these spiritual things, these things that have to do with heaven, these things that have to do with the afterlife, about God, about Jesus Christ. We can't really know, they say. But this is false. This is absolutely false. In contrast to these false ideas presented in Colossae, we see three clearly articulated truths presented in this passage. The first is that Jesus is the revelation of God. The second is that Jesus is the creator of all things. And the third is that Jesus is the sustainer of all things. Let's look at the first one. In the first half of verse 15, we see that Jesus is the revelation of God, the Father. Look with me at verse 15. It says, He is the image of of the invisible God. And we'll stop right there. He again, this is Jesus. And so he is the image of the invisible God. When we see this word image, this is actually the same word that we get our word icon from. Uh, and you could think of different things in order to understand what this is picturing. If you were to have a coin in your pocket, you know, probably no one here has a coin in your pocket because everyone uses cards nowadays. <laughs> Um, but if you had a coin in your pocket or in your purse, there is there's an image on that coin. There's an image of a building or there's an image of a person. And that represents something. That is showing you something of the actual building and of the actual person that it represents. Uh, you could think of your reflection in the mirror. When you get ready in the morning, you see a reflection of yourself. You see yourself in the mirror. And that is, again, the same idea of this word. This word was used in order to describe uh, a representation of something else. And so, for example, sometimes it was used to describe the relationship between a father and a child, and how the child can look like uh, the parent. And so, that is what we have here. We have that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And what this is saying is Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Excuse me. That is what Paul is saying here in this verse, that Jesus is God and he wants this to be understood very clearly. He says something to the effect, again, uh, not to the effect, but he says something specifically about this. And later on, if you turn to chapter 2, I just want you to see this one verse. In chapter 2 of Colossians and verse 9, it says, For in him, again, not talking about Jesus, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Which means that Jesus is God in the flesh. That he was truly God. And even Jesus claimed to be God. Which some people say that he didn't say that. But he did. Uh, I was thinking of one example. Whenever Jesus was talking to Philip there. In John chapter 14. And he said, show us the Father. And he said, how long have you been with me, Philip? And he would say, show me the Father. And, and, and so he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So he was saying, you just look to Jesus and you see the image of God. You see God in the flesh. That is who Jesus Christ is. He is God. If we want to see God, we look to Jesus Christ. And so, yes, he himself even claims to be God. 
And so you have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the Son of God. And even though these things are hard for us to understand, and we sometimes struggle to wrap our brains around them, uh, we just need to know that Jesus is, Jesus is God. He is God the Son. And we can say, Lord, help me to believe. <coughs> help me when I look at your word that I believe what it says and that I accept what it says about Jesus and that I believe in him truly, genuinely, in my heart. And even though I'm too small to fully understand all of you fully, that nonetheless I trust you. And that's what we want to say. Secondly, in the second half of verse 15, and in verse 16, we see that Jesus is the creator of all things. Look with me now again in verse 15. It says, The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Immediately upon reading this portion of our text, we see something that many, many people have misunderstood for thousands of years and that many people have mistaught. It says in the second half of verse 15, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn. There was a heresy more than 1,600 years ago in the early church. It was called Arianism. And it was propagated by a man named Arius. And he was a person who taught that there was a point when Jesus was not. That's what he taught. He taught that there was a point when Jesus was created and that he was a created being. And this was a, this was a heresy. And this really old heresies never die. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard that before. But they just take different forms. And we see them in the world today. And this heresy lives on in today's Jehovah's Witnesses. Who believe the same thing. They don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe they don't believe that. They believe he was a created being, like the highest of the angels or something. And this is totally, completely <coughs> false. We've already seen the deity, deity of Christ in the first half of verse 15. That he is the image of the invisible God. So we can see God in the flesh. And so now it's moving on, saying that he is the firstborn of all creation. And this is building upon the first half of verse 15. And this is emphasizing not that he was first cre created first, but that he was firstborn in the sense of prominence. The sense of prominence of position. In other words, he is first in order of rank of all creation. He is first in order of sovereignty over all creation. That is what this means here. There are a number of reasons for this. That Jesus can't be the created being. Um, just a few to note. In John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It says there that Jesus is the only begotten Son. And he cannot be both first begotten and the only begotten at the same time. Uh, secondly, Paul is trying to refute the false teaching in this church in Colossae that had false ideas about different things, including Jesus. And they were getting fuzzy about the truth of who Jesus really was. And so he is, he is opposing that, and he's trying to bring clarity to the situation to say that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus is God. And so he, that this, what it says here, that he's the firstborn, is in support of that argument. Uh, thirdly, it is impossible for Christ to be both created and the creator of all things. The Bible tells us that all things were came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. John chapter 1 and verse 3. And so Jesus created everything because, and he was able to do so because he is God. Look again at verse 16. It says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus created all things. In the beginning, of course, Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, as I quoted John 1.3, that, that all things came into being from him and there was not anything made that was made that was not made by him. 
Jesus was the one who spoke those things into existence back there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. Jesus was the divine agent of that creation. So you have God the Father who ordained and purposed to create all things. You have God the Son who was the one who spoke it all into existence. And you have the Holy Spirit who was involved there too, actually. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God was moving over the face of holy waters. And so there is in a sense, there's a sense in which God, the different persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they don't do anything apart from each other. And yet at the same time, we see in the scriptures certain works ascribed to each member of the Trinity that they perform. And Jesus, he, he is the creator. It says here in this verse, for by him all things were created. Well, then it lists some things. It, it talks about the, in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. You need to keep going on listing things, but he's, but he's just talking about all things have been created by him. But we see two different categories of things in this verse. We see things physical, and we see things <coughs> Spiritual things that are not physical in this verse. Just taking, again, how it says heavens and earth, visible and invisible. And so he's pointing out physical realities, but also spiritual realities. And now to some people, to say those two words together, spiritual realities, <laughs> some people don't believe in spiritual things at all. And so to put spiritual and reality together just doesn't make sense to some, to some people who aren't Christians. Um, but the, there are genuine things that God has created that aren't visible, but we can't see, such as the angels. And God created the angels as well. He has created, yes, the moon and the stars and the world, and we think of the trees and we think of the rivers and the oceans. And God has created all of those things, but he has also created the spiritual world, the invisible angels that we can't see. We better believe that there is a whole world out there of angels and demons, and they're all wrestling with each other for influence in the world, and of course there's the angels, the holy angels that are serving God and only, only trying to accomplish His purpose in the world. And, but then you have the demons who are opposed to God, they are in rebellion against God, and they are in service of Satan who is trying to oppose God's plan. And this is constantly going on at all times, even right now. Without the Bible, we would never know such things. And yet, they are true. Without the Bible, we wouldn't know a lot of things. Uh, think about the man Job in the Old Testament for a moment. The man Job went through things that most, if not all of us, have never gone through before. Suffered greater than most of us ever will in the book of Job. And in chapter 1 of the book of Job, it talks about how Satan went before God and was accusing Job before God, saying that he was wicked, trying to say that he wasn't good, even though God, even though God said that he was good and he was a righteous man, trying to lead up his family in the ways of God and teach them about God. And even though he was a righteous man, God allowed Satan to bring some things upon his life that were very difficult. He even lost all of his children in one day. He lost all of his possessions. He even had his wife tell him to curse God and to die. Job was afflicted in his body such that he was suffering and in pain. And he had nothing left. And it wouldn't have made, you know, as far as we know, we don't know, but as far as we know, Job doesn't know, didn't know about what happened there in chapter 1 of Job and how there was that going on with Satan trying to accuse Job. And so life can be very confusing. And we can have lots of question marks. And we can wonder, why is God allowing this? Or where is God in that and everything? But we have the benefit of knowing that no matter what happens, God is in control. And God is working all things out for good in the end. God, just as he was in control of the situation with Job, he is in control of all things, even in our lives. Jesus, we're told here in verse 16, has created all things. And we say, even the angels. 
Um, all authorities have been established by him. And all things visible, all things spiritual. Uh, God is exercising providential control, we call it, over all of his creation. And that is that even though we make our own decisions in life, and even though uh, there's so many moving parts and everything, that God is at work in his whole creation, even in each and every one of us individually and collectively, so that his will is being accomplished and the end is exactly what he wants it to be. That is God's providence, his providential control. All things in the universe are moving in the direction that he wants it to be. He will always accomplish his purposes. It says here at the end of verse 16, all things have been created through him and for him. I want you to see another thing before we move from this verse. In the beginning of the verse, it says, by him. You see that? For by him. And now, at the end of the verse, all things have been created through him, or by him in the future, and for him. So we have by him, and through him, and for him. This emphasizes to us that he is, first of all, the originator of all things, Secondly, that he is the agent through which all things have come. And thirdly, he is the supreme goal and end of all things that have been created. In the end, he's going to be the one that everyone has to to. In the end, we're going to acknowledge him as Lord. And in the end, every knee is going to have to bow. And all mouths are going to have to confess. And it's just a question of, did they do it too late or not? He is going to be the one that renders judgment. God has given all judgment to the Son, the Bible tells us. No matter what other powers or other authorities or governments or institutions there are out there, companies in the world, in the economy and in the marketplace, the United States of America, other countries, there is no authority greater than Jesus Christ. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, and verse 19. Now, not only is Jesus God, and not only is Jesus the creator, but Jesus is also the sustainer of all things. I want you to see this now in verse 17. Verse 17, Jesus is the sustainer of all things. It says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together, or all things consist. He, in the beginning of this verse, the first half, where it says, He is before all things, this here is saying that He is Lord over all of creation. This follows naturally from the previous verse, as it was talking about Him being the Creator. So obviously, if He created all things, He is in charge of all things, and He is Lord over His entire creation. Uh, I may have shared this before, I don't remember the last time it would have been, but I always remember this illustration when thinking about God's creation and how we are to behave in it. If you were to go and visit someone, someone's house, uh, a friend, let's say, or a co-worker, you are a guest in that person's house. And you know that when you're a guest in someone's house, that is different than when you're in your own house. You can't do all the same things that you can do in your house as you in the other person's house. Uh, in the other person's house, you might have you know, the privilege of access to drinks, some snacks or something. Um, you might get to watch TV with the person, but of course, the owner of the house is going to have to go to the room. And, and <laughs> so you can't do everything. You can't paint the walls. You can't move the furniture. It's not your house. So in God's creation, He has created everything, and it's His. All the water is His, the air is His, so when we take a sip of water, and when we breathe the air, we are drinking His water, when we are breathing His air. And this creation is His. That means He makes the rules. He gets to decide what we are allowed to do or not. He gets to have the sovereignty. It says He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. When it says all things consist, this is speaking to God's sustainment of his creation. That he maintains everything. That he upholds all things. And that he keeps things running. And so again, this is what we call providence. 
the universe is dependent upon him in order to continue as it is, in order to hold together as we see it. The fact that we continue to exist at all is only because of Jesus. He allows us to continue to exist. Everything has come from him. And when we have anything, we have received it from him. The Bible tells us all good gifts are given from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. James chapter 1. This should be a tremendous comfort to all Christians, isn't it? When we remember these truths, if you are truly a believer and you think about Jesus Christ, this is a comfort to us. I mentioned this earlier in Sunday school, this, this same idea that some of the truths in the Bible are, are a comfort to Christians, but at the same time, they are a warning and should be unsettling to a non-believer. The fact that Jesus is the creator, the fact that he has made all things, the fact that he is the Lord of all things, and that he is the only way to get to heaven should be the most terrifying truth to anyone that is not a Christian. What does it mean for me if I am in opposition to him? I would like you to turn with me to Psalm 104 as we close. Psalm 104. This is a psalm that talks about God and his creation. It talks about how he works in his creation and yes, his providence and how he maintains his creation. The same thing with Psalm 104. Psalm 104. And starting in verse 14. It says, He causes the grass to grow for the cattle, and vegetation for the labor of man, so that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine which makes man's heart glad, so that he may make his face glisten with oil, and food which sustains man's heart. The trees of the Lord drink their fill, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds build their nests, and the stork whose home is the fir trees. And I want to stop right there. So this is the same thing we've been seeing in Colossians. Just some more examples of how God maintains his creation and keeps it going. And I don't know about you, but for me, I need reminded of that. Um, I need that in my life to know that God is in control of every situation. Even though we can't see him. Even though, uh, you know, we don't know all the reasons why he does the things that he does or allows some of the things that he does. And... His blessings, I have to remind myself, are not dependent upon my emotional feelings that given day. It's based upon truth given to us from God's Word, realities that are so. He is always working. When we look at this passage in Colossians that we've been looking at, there can be no doubt that Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of all things. That is the message of our text that we've been looking at. And we need to not just know that in our heads today. We need to acknowledge that in our lives today. And remember that throughout the week when we leave this place. We must believe it to the point where it changes our whole attitude for the whole rest of the day and the week. How much trouble, let me ask this question, how much trouble would we save ourselves if we were to give Jesus Christ the preeminence in our lives today? Give him the first place. Give him the priority. Who else is there that's worthy of praise? Just Jesus. Only Jesus. And we can praise him in every way imaginable. We can sing to him. We can play instruments to him. So that seems to be. We can praise him in every way that we can. Now listen. Without Jesus in your life, all of your earthly efforts in this life will never reap a spiritual harvest in heaven. Let me say that again. Without Jesus in your life, all of your earthly efforts in this life will never reap a spiritual harvest in heaven. Without Jesus in your life, there is no heaven. There's a hymn which has these words. And with this I'll close. Who is he on yonder tree? Dies in grief and agony. Tis the Lord of wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him round.
around him. Lord of all. Amen. We're going to sing our final song, which is going to be hymn number 389.